We'll let my fellow co-chair also introduce himself and kind of kick this off since uh, he was on a plane this morning. Yes, um, I'm here as a result of a minor miracle. <laughs> um, all the plane tickets were gone, and the travel agent actually said to me, this is God telling you you shouldn't go to this meeting. <laughs> and, I, and I responded, anything else? <laughs> or is that the only thing? Um, and just as the travel agent was saying that, the ticket became available on my app. And boom, here I am. So um, it's been wonderful to, to listen to so many different perspectives on this interesting question of faith and health. Um, Sandy was kind enough, because I was supposed to do the introduction, but I flew in this morning just to, to listen, just to make a few observations. And I'm going to make very few observations. I would say that I was thinking during this whole time what makes a partnership successful between faith and health and the public sector. And I came up with six things from the various discussions. And these are, you know, just different things. One is where the uh, faith organization can bring energy and resources to a particular problem. Um, and I particularly like the example from Los Angeles. The second is where the faith organization brings organization and, um, uh, and sort of a, a network to the problem, such as the idea of helping people get jobs or helping people get legal help. The third was the social um, outreach and some of the factors that affect illness that are outside the medical realm, that faith is naturally working in those areas and can help people. The fourth was trust, which was like number one, two, and three up there. Uh, the fifth may be a little bit more, more uh, worthy of discussion, but I felt that the more successful ones really you could understand that it was actually a partnership and that there was some uh, understanding that the health and medical side um, might, uh, knew, knew the evidence and were going to bring the services that would be effective. And I thought this was really, uh, to me, the, the point was made in the Methodist presentation where they said, we want to listen and we want to show you what we can offer. It wasn't quite saying whatever you want we'll give you, including things that might not work. It was, we have a sense of what we can do, and that's going to be based on you know, what we know about blood pressure, what we know about diabetes, what we know about these things to work. We, and we want to find the things that, that work for you, but it's going to be also the things that we think are actually going to be effective. And the flip side of that is, I think that there's a danger um, where uh, a faith um, uh, partnership may feel like they know entirely themselves what's going to work, and the evidence is not relevant to that. So I see this as a true partnership. You have to ha respect certainly the ability of the uh, faith organizations to do so many different things, but also the fact that there is um, evidence and a reason why certain types of treatments are very important and effective. And an example of that in the drug treatment space would be the use of medication-assisted treatment, which is very, very effective at preventing overdose. Um, and then finally, I thought very interesting uh, the, the potential for, for advocacy um, and the work that faith community can do to really make some of these um, issues where there is this partnership um, uh, known and, and advanced and really put forward in a different way, really, using a whole different set of connections and tools that maybe health organizations typically can't reach. So I, those are my six observations. I learned a tremendous amount. I really personally want to thank everybody for organizing this event. Maybe join me if it's possible to thank everybody who is here and put this together. And I will turn it over to Sandy, who's responsible for organizing. I hope that was okay, Sandy. Okay. I live in fear that I'm disappointing Sandy. No. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. All right. So this is the time for reflections. And uh, Josh had a fabulous example of some things that really hit him uh, during this time. So uh, I want you to start thinking, because I'm going to share my reflections, and then we're going to ask others to come 
to the microphone and share your reflections. And one of the reasons to do that is that we are um, at the National Academies very strict about putting into the proceedings only what is shared at the uh, workshop. So if you have something that you say, I, I want to embellish, I want to summarize like Josh did, I want to just call it out uh, for the proceedings, we would love to hear that uh, wisdom or any other thing that, that you'd like to add. So be thinking about your thoughts on that, particularly it's, it's open to anyone, but particularly to roundtable uh, members as you have a responsibility uh, to add into this. Um, so I wanted to highlight uh, two things that just um, hit to me uh, in addition to the summary we've done in the uh, liberating structures and what Josh shared was uh, Joy Sharp. Uh, is Joy still here? Does she have to leave? She's coming back. Okay. Joy shared real quickly a slide that went by fast about eight strengths that communities of faith brought. And... Um, since they are in Gary's book, and I am not paid to try to sell his book, Deep, Deeply Woven Roots, but they're in his uh, book, and there are eight of them, strengths that um, faith-based uh, communities bring. Strengths to accompany, to convene, to connect. Strengths to tell stories, to give sanctuary. Strengths to bless, to pray, and to endure. So I just thought it was good to reiterate those. They went by pretty quickly of um, strengths that faith communities bring and can bring into this partnership um, that we can have in communities. And then the, the last, uh, the second one for me was, uh, again, uh, it was uh, um, coming from the Greater Cleveland congregations. Uh, it was that last celebratory moment when you had the quote from Rob English that said, uh, in part, there are moments when we can walk with history as citizens help make history. And the reason that one particularly hit me, um, how many of you watched the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games? How many of you watched that? It was in Seoul, Korea. Um, if you remember that moment, when the Olympic flame was being carried to the top of that huge, huge platform, and there were two young soccer players that came together, one from North Korea, one from South Korea, and together they climbed those many, many stairs to get to the top, and they were collaboratively carrying that flame to light the torch. And it was just this moment of hope hope, this moment of hope that there could be peace. If there's an existential threat, Dr. Ed Ellinger in Minnesota often talks about existential threats to population health, and one of them is lack of peace. You will say equity is an, or inequity is, an, is another one. But it just, it was a moment of hope as you watch these two young soccer players from very different perspectives in those countries climb up there. And then um, at the end of this, uh, as the ceremonies ended, there was a commentator on American television who quoted Otto Van, von Bismarck and said, quote, the statesman's task is to hear God's footsteps marching through history and to try and catch onto his coattails as he marches past. So as that thing about making history and kind of the greater Cleveland congregations, kind of catching onto those coattails and making history. There are moments when we can walk with history as citizens help make history. Uh, so I think our faith-based allies and communities can be collaborators for helping us do just that, bring peace, healing, health, and well-being uh, to our communities. So with that, as my reflections and Josh's reflections, I'm going to open it up uh, to others. Should we, what's the best mic? I have, okay, so let's have people come to this microphone. I think we can record it better and share your reflections uh, for the day and your comments.
Uh, I think I was uh, struck by the presentation, Paul, about UMA, about the fact that uh, it was organized by Muslim medical students. It was funded uh, majority. Majority of the funding comes from the Muslim community. You had only 2% of the folks in the clinic are, that you see are Muslim, which to me was really the power of, you know, uh, faith and mission independent of the denomination. And I thought that was pretty cool. It's something that stuck with me about uh, what the drivers were about. Ultimately, it's very much a, an issue of a human assist you in terms of uh, the, 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 uh, the faith and mission to take care irrespective of background and uh, where people come from. appreciated the whole day. It was fabulous. Um, but one of the things that, as I mentioned in my question, and really resonated for me today, um, had to do with promoting and, and um, expanding access to um, mental health and behavioral health services. And so Kristen Peachy, when she talked about um, alignment with public health services and the work that they were doing around um, trauma-informed congregations, and building out the, the capacity for um, that community was really powerful and something that I'd like to see happen within my state. Um, those convenings and the increased um, awareness around ACEs um, is so important. And within the Native American community and tribes within our state, um, the ACE scores and the impact to health for um, the, the members within our, our tribal communities, that is um, so important for, for the things that we're doing when we look at faith and health and those populations. Dave Kindig, University of Wisconsin. Um, I wrote this on my card, but it obviously didn't make the list, so I'm going to try it, I'm going to try it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the thing that has stuck with me, a simple thing, but maybe not, is several people mentioned that hope was a, uh, if not a unique, a uh, powerful strength of faith-based organizations. So. Uh, um, I had never thought of that, so that was a new thought. Um, and whether it's unique or just strong, I don't know. And I've never thought either of hope as a factor in the health production function. You know, we always think about all these other inputs that make it. So if it, is, if it could be, then that would at least, and in times when work gets tough and you can get cynical. I mean, that might be a unique contribution that that partnership could bring to the effort. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I thought about today. I was struck by one of the very first things we heard, and that was that there are 250,000 neighborhoods uh, in the United States, but there are 350,000 congregations uh, and the opportunity that that presents. I never had any concept of that unbelievable number. But at the same time, I come from New England, I come from New Hampshire, and I hear and I read that actually, and we heard a little bit today, that the churches are emptying. Uh, and that, and I, my, my wife plays... Uh, Renaissance and Baroque music, and many of her concerts are in churches, and we go to the church services, and she plays. And there are many fewer people in those pews than are here today, and it just makes me 
wonder, are we bowling alone? And uh, why is that? And um, uh, I don't want to say that there isn't hope. There is hope. Uh, and there is an incredible power of spirit. But um, just wondering what that means. That's, that's my reflection. <laughs> So, um, as always, uh, with these roundtable uh, discussions, I'm always uh, probably more overwhelmed and reflective, but I, I really appreciated the, the topic. I appreciated all of the speakers. Um, um, just constant reminder of the amount of work we have to do in communities to, to make communities whole. <clears throat> A couple of things that just sort of resonated with me. Um, one is the notion of, uh, of the faith community as assets. Um, and the, the joy that I, that I really felt today was that the, their emphasis on service sort of minimized for me that sense of competitiveness that I often see when folks are really trying to carve out their space or fight for the resources to, to support the same people. And so I really valued that sense of service versus that sense of competitiveness. And, and just the, really the value of the faith community as an anchor institution uh, in communities, in these communities, their history and their longevity. Uh, I think that's the endure piece of the work. But, you know, I wanted to just also say that, you know, one other thought that was sort of floating through my mind is that um, because they're an asset, because they're trusted, because they've worked through history and they've seen so much in communities, and to not have a space in really fighting for some of the institutional challenges that we see, like race, that didn't come up, and I think I heard somebody say, when the cards were going around that people didn't see that as a factor. And many of these upstream activities are civil rights issues, um, trying to find employment, trying to find good health care. These are the things that one of your kings fought for uh, and many people in this room. So to not have the church, to, to have the church as a safety net, I value that. To have the church not be focal in society where we know that much of what we're seeing and what people are struggling with is troubling to me. Even though I'm a, I'm a Christian, I, I am not apologetic, and I love the faith. And, but I will say that the Ohio example was inspiring to me, that you did take on a civil rights issue, whether people see ACA as that or not. And so... I believe in the power of the church to begin to move and shape what's happening politically and contextually in these communities. And, you know, and I'm hopeful that churches will continue to step up in that space. And then the last thing that was more of a reminder that um, as human service providers, which many of the faith-based institutions are, are doing, they're struggling with the same issues that the human service sector is struggling with, and that is a need farther than, greater than, or demand greater than what they can supply, and this whole notion of sustainability. We do this good, we make a difference, and then how do we continue this, or how do we erase it from society? So that, I think someone asked a question, how are you moving people towards opportunity? Um, and faith is a, I think it is a journey, but we should be moving people away from that need to be needy, but to now be missionary. And so, you know, how do we, how do we get there, not just in the faith community, but in the human service sector as well. Uh, thank you for <coughs> this opportunity.
to be here today and to listen to this. Uh, I'd like to perhaps say something slightly different. Um, what I heard today in terms of the presentations of what people are doing in this country is really quite powerful at times, really very moving, in fact. Um, and it gives us a good idea of at least some of the phenomena of what you could call faith health or what we have called religious health assets and their character. But I've also been working with these phenomena for some 20 years now and writing a lot about them and looking at them in Africa and Europe and elsewhere. And uh, I am deeply disturbed, not by anything today, but by a frequent attempt to claim some sort of privilege for faith, to regard it as having a position uh, that others do not have. Um, and that's not always true, as a lot of people in medical practice well know, and indeed in any field you like, it's highly ambiguous. And I think uh, as much as I deeply appreciate what I've heard today, there is a sense in me that there is selection bias in what I've heard. Um, and that we could be inspired by that, but also misled by that. And what, what I mean is that we are hearing about phenomena and there are many of them I've encountered and studied and researched together with my colleagues like Gary and TC and others in Africa and elsewhere. They are very diverse and they are also not always very positive. They are sometimes highly ambiguous. So we cannot claim that it's because they are faith communities that they are the essential things we need to be working with. So how do we know what binds those that we should be working with? What drives them down below deeply that unites all of them? What unites the phenomena behind that rather than simply individual examples that might inspire, but only in particular contexts and for particular people? Uh, what, is, what are the conditions that allow these things to emerge in the first place that we need to be understanding and working with and encouraging? We've said very little about that. We've said very little, if I want to put it differently, about conceptual or theoretical understandings of what it is we are describing. And we've got to, if we're going to take, I mean this in the broadest sense and not in the narrow, simply empirical sense, if we are going to take a scientific attitude towards that, we have to raise those questions. And there are some profound issues that are lurking there that I don't think we touched on today, that maybe were not the point of the day, but that I would like to encourage at least the round table to take up far more seriously. And just a hint at some of them. A lot of what we describe still reflects what many uh, people have called, and I would call in this case the Cartesian split between empirical science and practical wisdom which is a split we do not experience in ourselves as human beings, but which, for which we create categories we now separate things from. I think it's impossible to avoid a siloed approach or to deal properly with questions of alignment as long as we do that. Um, the second thing I think is a problem that is direct reflection over this in the language of health and of medicine as I have encountered it and I have had to learn a great deal about it in the last 20 years, is the language of proximal and distal, or upstream and downstream, which in itself already separates the activities that are involved, when in fact we're all standing in the same stream and looking at it from other sides of the bank. We need to understand what that means and how these sides themselves contribute to understanding what it means to be in that stream. Um, that's the second thing I'd want to say. The third thing is... The ambiguities in faith are rich and deep. That's, in fact, my field, religious studies, and I have grown up in a country that reflects that as thoroughly as you can. I worked with an anti-apartheid organization in a country uh, for a Christian anti-apartheid organization that was outlawed by the state, a state that called itself a Christian state. You can't get much more ambiguous than that. We have to take that seriously. 
But it is also true of medicine. The ambiguities of medicine and of healthcare practice, in my view, are not adequately addressed in our time, as if we all understand and know exactly what we're doing. And I think, as much as it may be dated in some ways, that even something like Ivan Illich's book on medical nemesis, written decades ago, still has something very powerful to say to what the problems there are. Um, the, third, the fourth thing I would like to say is the question of how you prioritize resources and allocate funds to the various kinds of activities you were talking about. Uh, I was asked to be a keynote speaker at the uh, end of five years of a, uh, believe me, it was a very strange invitation. I still think, why the hell did they invite me? But anyway, I was to be a keynote speaker to a two-day conference bringing together leaders of health systems in Europe after a five-year research program funded by the German government across 16 institutions on the prioritization of medicine. And they were trying to decide how to allocate resources, personnel, staff, government, uh, private resources, whether it should be done vertically in terms of population groups or patient groups, or whether it should be done horizontally, this is the language they were using, in terms of different kinds of illnesses or diseases. And it seemed to me that the fundamental flaw here is that it's a disconnect. Uh, there actually is a systemic involvement of these things at all levels, and unless you, unless you prioritize the system rather than one or the other, you are going to run into the same problems over and over again. But we don't know what that means. And that's something that an engagement with faith health from medicine should begin to enable us to begin to explore and probe far more deeply. Uh, the th second last thing I would want to say is that um, one of the things we have learned in working with faith health and religious health assets is the critical importance of the intangible. And a great deal of what we focus on is the tangible, which is what practical people want. I want to see something happen and work and produce the right results and measurable and I, there, there's no way that's not absolutely critical. But it takes, because it is so dominant and powerful, our attention away from the intangible and we do, this is a purely personal judgment from my reading and experience and encounters over the last 20 years with health and medicine and with people in those fields, we do a far less adequate job than do economists of their field who are exquisitely capable of taking, for example, uh, account of what sentiment means. What is sentiment? <laughs> it's not anything empirical and yet it has a massive role to play in a great deal of economics. There's something very important about the intangible when it comes to what it means to be a human being who claims to have a faith and to act out of a particular understanding of the way they are in the world and what that means for how they behave and whether they follow a protocol or not. Uh, that must be understood far more deeply. And finally, none of this in my view can be understood unless it goes back to the beginnings and the heart of medicine or public health in particular, but medicine too, or indeed several other practices we engage in. And I would say that's true of the core of, uh, of great religious traditions too. And that is that why do we do this? Towards what, what ends? What is the purpose? What is the moral imagination that drives us to even engage in this in the first place? Which easily got, gets lost in the exchange of market relations or in the lure of science that drives us into specialties and allows us to ignore the people that we ultimately are there to serve. Thank you. Um, I reflected a lot during the whole day about one of the things that Gary had said, and I wrote down the question to, to turn whatever it was he said into a question for myself, which is how do we make the invisible things that connect us visible? And this is somewhat of a springboard off the last two comments in that uh, I heard some things that 
are leading me toward at least a better understanding of what might comprise an answer to that. Uh, in Joy's presentation, where she started talking about the infrastructure and that, that from a st sustainability standpoint, we need to uh, really take advantage of the moment that we're in and start building that infrastructure at the community level so that we can take advantage of new payment models and things that are much driven by the much more traditional healthcare system, if you will. Um, in terms of measurement and being able to quantify the value. But just like the last comment, we can't do that at the expense of the intangible, but stories and some of the things laid out in Gary's book, that that might be a way to start making the in, intangible a little more visible um, by being able to describe and tell stories and show value in that in that way. And then the last thing that occurred to me, and I, I'm not sure of your name, I'm sorry, but the comment before the last one about the role of the church in the systemic racism and some of the things that have contributed to the very things that we're trying to solve today, um, there's both a glorious role, and that's what we've been about today, of the church, but there's also a dark side to the church that we do not like to talk about, and honestly, we refuse to talk about in many circumstances, and 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 I, I just would like to say amen to that, and I'm sorry that we didn't talk more about that, but I, but I do think that this is a moment, and that the faith health movement is probably a really good place to begin having those really tough discussions. Um, and that it's really only in doing that that we can begin to address some of the questions that others have raised. But thank you. I'd like to share something that was sent by one of our former members and former co-chair of the roundtable, George Isham, and it was actually a comment that he, and question that he had earlier um, that I think is, is so great. I, I it, it hate for us to not have an opportunity to reflect on it. And it actually goes, I think, to Jim's point about ambiguities on both sides. Um, George wrote in response to um, Kirsten Peachy's talk, one of the moral issues that I think we wrestle with in promoting better health in populations is the tension between the large amount of resource in healthcare and healthcare institutions and the relatively smaller impact of healthcare um, and sorry, relatively smaller impact of healthcare and healthcare institutions on health. Many of our healthcare institutions have been or are currently governed by faith-based organizations from many faith traditions, of which the advocate organization is one example. Does moral imagination, as put forth by Ms. Peachy, include self-examination of the behavior of the institution with regard to this imbalance as reflected in the impulse to garner resources and market share in communities at the expense of resources for other key determinants of health, such as adequate housing, education, and so forth. One last topic. Hopefully it's not the last. There's plenty to, to hear about this topic, but you know, um, George's, George's question um, you know, sort of had me thinking about the the little dialogue we had with Secretary Cohen here, and in a way, in a way, it it felt like a, a interlude in, in an otherwise you know sort of faith oriented conversation, and it it struck me sort of toward the end of the day that it really matters what we put our faith in. When when Phyllis asked her, you know, why does she have optimism that things could change now? Her her answer was an answer of of faith, faith in in new ways. Of, of conveying value and paying for things differently and seeing entrenched institutions, I industries, um, being in flux and maybe in a direction more, more aligned with where George was suggesting um, we need to rebalance our, our investments. And if you look sort of more broadly at American culture, we put a lot of faith in markets and medicine and trickle-down economics and technologies. And, and, you know, in many ways, there, are, there is good in there, but but there's manifest harm there too. And so the question that I think we've talked about today is where communities um, driven by faith can put faith in people, faith in communities and cultures um, in, in a process of actually learning together through common work and being able to reach across differences that, that might be really the only ways of correcting some of the harms uh, you know, that have accumulated by by our faith in, in 
or loc- locating our faith in places that are disconnected from the things that really fuel our health and well-being. Um, we began this day with a, a discussion about sort of the moral force of heritage and, and legacies that we've inherited, um, some of which is, is really elicits uh, a, a demand for us to act in our own time in, in, in important ways, but also carries a legacy of, of real harm and pain and, and a need to reconcile sort of misdeeds of the past and what's that going to be in, in our time. And I think we saw in many of the case examples the, 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 you know, the force of that history being re, um, recast in a, in a sort of a more of a renaissance story going forward. I, I wouldn't want to lose that. The last two points, um, there was a theme, you know, sort of very explicitly in the Uma story about flattening hierarchies of power in order to then locate a discussion about power that, that's not so much about power over, but power with. And, you know, we saw a terrific example in the, in the o- Ohio you know, what can happen when you have power with, uh, as opposed to who's going to get what of a, you know, of a fixed pie. Um, and then, you know, I, I think the, this, I sort of walk away with, I, I don't know where this fits in the eight list of, of uh, things that faith brings, but it, it seems to fuel this courage to ask really tough questions, to face facts. You know, Gary um, began with the word holy curiosity. It's a, it's a nice word for us as as scientists and as practitioners about what, what the courage is to ask really hard questions about a system that isn't working very well, and then to do the hard work that's needed to remake it. It is the world as it is, but it doesn't have to be that way. And we have quite a bit of power to reshape uh, you know, the world as it is tomorrow to be something a lot closer to the, to the one that um, I think we're capable of creating. Well, with that uh, note, and I think we have opened, I think as Gary said earlier, opened this conversation. We have not closed it. I want to thank all of you for coming and for staying uh, through this day and contributing your wisdom on this topic. I particularly want to thank um, the staff of the National Academies, and could I ask them to stand? Come on. Where's Kamani? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for all the hard work that goes behind the scenes and in the scenes uh, to make these workshops uh, happen and all the work that will go on afterwards. And then we could not uh, close today without thanking the wonderful people of Shaw University for opening up their house uh, and their place here to us and being such accommodating um, uh, people to work with and to share uh, their legacy as well as their space with us. Um, So with that, uh, we are adjourned. And thank you so much. And uh, be safe as you travel.